suppose that uh, we have uh, a field like something like this linear linear phase. And this all goes then to a given point here. So I have a constant times a linear phase like this. And that gives me the Fourier transform, something that is very localized, like a delta function here. So what is the phase on this side? It's not constant, because it's a, it's a linear phase. Because it's a, the rays are tilted, so the phase is different here than here than here. It increases linear. The wavefronts are perpendicular to the rays. So what happens if I take the complex conjugate of this? The, the, the phase, instead of increasing, decreases, let's say, which means that we reverse the, the, the direction of the field. So if I change the, 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 if I complex conjugate this field, if the field is, uh, say, here the phase is more advanced than here, but if I reverse it, it's going to be backwards. So, so actually, this is going to go in the other direction, and therefore, the light is going to end up not here, but where? Here at the mirror image which is what this is telling us. Rather than the, 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 there's a minus sign here in the argument telling us that the light is, the, the, this is going to move to this side. So again, there's a easy physical interpretation for, for this property. The Fourier transform of the complex conjugate is a complex conjugate evaluated at a minus sign. OK. And what this tells us, by the way, is if the field is real, if f equals f, f star, then uh, f tilde is f star tilde minus. That means that the real part is symmetric and the imaginary part is anti-symmetric. But uh, for the current uh, topic, this is not so important. For other topics, this is really important. OK, we can skip that one. So to summarize, we went through this. this there is a list of the, of the properties. So Parseval, that this integral is the same as this integral. And in fact, you can do it with two different functions. f star g is the same as f tilde star g tilde. They don't have to be the same function. Uh, then the shift phase thing, that if I shift a function, I, I cause a phase in the, in the Fourier transform. Or if I put a, fa a linear phase in the function, I cause a shift in the Fourier transform. Uh, scaling, if I make my function narrower or wider, I make the Fourier transform the opposite. Uh, derivatives turn into multiplication uh, by the variable to the nth times a constant and the other way around. Convolution goes into a product or a product goes into convolution. Then we have this uncertainty relation. And finally, this property of the complex conjugate. So before I move on to physical optics applications of these properties, well, first, are there questions about any of these? No? OK. So the, 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 the oh, OK, so the examples, we, we already played with these three. So now we can see how we would do this one. Just by if, given that we have that, we just use the shift property here. In this one, what property would I use? Scaling and, and shifting. In this one, the convolution. So the Fourier transform of rect is something called sync. So the Fourier transform of rect convolved with rect is what? Sync times sync or sync squared. So any function convolved with itself, its Fourier transform is just the square of the Fourier transform of the function. Uh, and then here we did the Gaussian, and then x times the Gaussian, we just use the formula for the derivative of the result. So it's all, it's all very easy. So you can, you can play with this uh, later uh, on your own. So very quickly in preparation for what I'm going to do next, is, is there a question? OK. Uh, what happens in two dimensions? Someone was asking, how about bigger dimensions? Well, two is very important for Fourier optics. I'm going to stick with two. We're not going to keep going to three, four, but you could. So now I'm going to use the convention of x underscore 
meaning a two vector, vector x comma y, so two component vector. And new underline underscore is nu sub x comma nu sub y. It's a two vector as well. And the dot product, of course, between this is this times the first one plus the second times the second. And all the same properties hold, so, so you can define the, the Fourier transform in the same way. Well, first, convolution in two dimensions is the same thing, but we have to integrate over both x and y. So it's the same definition, but just in x and y. The delta function, this is interesting, so it's, it's a delta of a vector, it has two arguments, and now its units are one over x squared. It's the product of the inverse of each argument because we have to inter integrate it over both variables to get one. The Fourier transform is defined the same way, except because x and nu are vectors now, this has to be the dot product, meaning x times nu sub x plus y times nu sub y. And same with the inverse Fourier transform. And all the properties look very similar. Uh, they just the vector versions of these. Uh, notice here, uh, for example, x, now x is a vector, so it's a vector multiplying the function, this has to be a vector, and the vector is the vector derivative, it is the gradient of the function. So gradients go to the variable and the other way around. And the uncertainty happens to lose a factor of two. That's the only effect. Okay. Now, in optics, we like things that have rotational symmetry. So if I have a Fourier transform in two dimensions like this, F tilde of nu underscore equal uh, the double integral from minus infinity to infinity of F of x e to the i e to the minus i 2 pi x dot nu dx dy. Um, what if this function here only depended on, how did I call it, rho? So it's just a function of rho, where rho is uh, the square root of x squared plus y squared. So rather than having x and y, we play with rho and phi, uh, theta. So I can change variables here, but what matters then is that x dot nu is now, x is rho times what? Cosine theta, comma, rho sine theta, dot, the same thing for nu, I'm gonna say this is nu, the radius, time cosine phi, I'm gonna call the angle in, in, in the other space, comma, nu sine phi, and what is this equal to? Rho, rho nu, in front of everything, and then cosine, cosine, plus sine, sine, Ah, do we remember this one? <laughs> Don't look at the screen. <laughs> Turns out that it is minus. Which makes sense because it only depends on the angle between the two vectors. It could not depend on the sum. If I have this is x and this is rho, it can only depend on this angle. And that's uh, theta minus rho, uh, theta minus phi. So I can make that substitution. Uh, now this is an integral from zero to infinity, an integral from zero to two pi, f rho of rho, if our function happens to have rotational symmetry, in the, it's independent of phi. If it is not independent of phi, we're in trouble. But if it is independent of phi, then we can do this. And then we have e to the minus i 2 pi rho nu cosine theta minus phi rho v phi v rho. 
And I can bring this integral in phi here, and I can do that in closed form. It gives me something called a Bessel function. So this turns out, how many of you have never heard of a Bessel function? OK, so a Bessel function is, is, well, I guess I can just define it that way. So I can, let me write this like this. Integral from 0 to infinity, and then I'm going to put this, ah, uh, I'm going to put f rho of rho, and then integral 0 to 2 pi, e to the minus i 2 pi rho nu cosine of phi, uh, theta minus phi, d theta rho d rho. And this thing here happens to be 2 pi times something called the Bessel function of order 0. So there's a discrete number of Bessel functions, and it's evaluated at whatever multiplies these things. So it's 2 pi rho nu. So the, this now becomes 2 pi 0 to infinity f rho of rho j 0 2 pi rho nu rho d rho. And this is g a form of the Fourier transform with only one integral, even though we're in two dimensions. And this is sometimes called the Hankel transform. It's just uh, another way of writing the Fourier transform if we have rotational symmetry. So it's given by this. And the inverse Hankel transform looks the same way. OK, so while I get the, the next thing ready, why don't you try this? So evaluate the Hankel transform. Of these three functions, when f is a delta, when f is 1 for rho less than a given a and 0 outside, and forget about the third one. You can do the third one at home. Just try the first two, and I'll give you a few minutes. Has anyone finished one? Yes, look quickly at. Uh, yeah. OK, let me do the first one, and then I'll do the second one. So if f rho of rho is delta of rho minus a, f tilde of nu, it turns out that it only depends on nu, is 2 pi. 0 to infinity, then I just put this delta rho minus a, j 0 to pi rho nu, rho v rho. And what is this equal to? So what, what does this delta function do? It sets rho equal to a everywhere, and then it removes the integral. So this just gives me 2 pi 
uh, j0 to pi rho, uh, sorry, a nu uh, times nu, like that. And I'm doing these examples because they're going to have an importance in imaging. What about the second one? I was just checking that you were paying attention. Okay. Okay, what happens, so this is what is called a, a circ function or a cake function sometimes. Uh, because if I plot this function, how does it look? It's, it's one inside of a circle and zero outside. So if I were to draw it in 3D, it would be like uh, this sitting on, on zero. So it's like a cake uh, with radius one. And it represents very well what happens when we have an aperture, which we're going to have in our lenses, system, lens system, so on. So, uh, so if I insert this function into the integral, what effect does it have? The integral goes from where to where now? Zero to A, because after that it turns off. So zero to A, and then that's F, and then we have J zero of two pi rho nu rho d rho. And what do I do now? Oh, if I only knew the properties of Bessel functions. Ah, that's good. So I'm going to use that. So if I call this u prime, then I need to put a, I need to complete this u prime here. Uh, so I need to put a 2 pi nu. So I have, so I'm going to leave some room to put whatever I need there. So I have J0 U prime. And then this row to become a U prime needs what? A 2 pi, which has there a new. So I'm going to put a new here. And then the, uh, that's U prime. What about the row? It also needs a 2 pi nu. So I'm going to put a 1 over 2 pi nu squared. The u prime. And this goes from 0 to where? What is u prime when rho is equal to a? 2 pi a nu, 2 pi a nu. And now this is 2 pi nu squared. And if I use that formula, this becomes u, which is this guy here, 2 pi a nu times J1, the first special function, instead of the zero special function, uh, of 2 pi a nu. And this, I can cancel the 2 pi, I can cancel the nu. This is a 
j1 2 pi a nu divided by nu. It is the diffraction pattern that we're going to be using. Yes. And this is the diffraction pattern if we use an annular pupil that has been proposed for some applications. Sometimes you want an annular pupil, someone you want a solid pupil. The third one that we, that uh, the third example is what is called an apodized pupil, or one form of an apodized pupil, which is you don't want the pupil to drop from one to zero immediately, but you want it to go gradually. It's a quadratic. And that will remove in this function some of the oscillations. So turns out it gives you uh, J2. So you, 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 yeah, it's wider, but, but it doesn't oscillate so fast. Just like this one, because this one's very discontinuous, this one is the narrowest one, but it oscillates a lot. This one is a bit wider, but it oscillates less, and, and, and the other one. We, we can plot them later. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, what, what is missing? Uh, is is eliminated? Uh, no, because there were two. We needed one for row and one for the row. So this one participated with row, let's say, in turning into u prime, but d row needed another one, and we had to compensate by putting one downstairs. So we needed two two pies, one for this and one for this. And we only had one, so we had to put this downstairs. It's what, sorry? Yeah, but it, it, when I plot them later, it oscillates less. And these oscillations, for some applications, are a bad thing. So that's what this term apodization means. means that you go, rather than having a pupil that is sharp, you have something that goes to zero. And the effect that that has on the Fourier transform is that instead of having something like that, that goes like this and oscillates a little bit, you get something that is slightly wider, but it doesn't oscillate. Pot, what does this mean in, in etymologically? The, when you go to the podiatrist, it's your feet. So they think of this as the feet, like the, the, these oscillations. So it's removing the feet. And it literally means removing the feet. So it's, it's to remove these oscillations, uh, side oscillations. So you do it by sacrificing some energy because you're, you're uh, having an aperture that is less and less uh, transmissive as you go to the edges. And because you're making your function narrower, your Fourier transform is going to be wider uncertainty, but it's not oscillatory. So it, it depends on the application. Sometimes you, sometimes you don't care about these feet, these oscillations, these side lobes. Sometimes you really care about them. In fact, the best apodization is if you try to do so, something like a Gaussian, that drops like a Gaussian, because then then it, it drops quickly and is pretty much a Gaussian without any oscillations. Okay. How am I doing? Very good. Okay, so the last part in these notes is to do with discrete Fourier transform, which is how we approximate a Fourier transform with uh, the computer. And it turns out that there's a discrete operation, which is uses sums instead of integrals that does a good approximation at a Fourier transform. I'm going to go very quickly through this because I want to move on to physical optics. Um, so this is a sum from zero to some 
number n minus 1. That means there are n elements in this sum. And it has an exact inverse transformation. Looks the same. You normalize by 1 over square root of n. And instead of a minus, you have a plus. And if you want to approximate a Fourier transform with, with this discrete Fourier transform, because we want this to go from minus infinity to infinity when we approximate an integral, we need to take the second part of this sum, because this is periodic, and put it at the beginning. So we want something more like this, from here to here. Uh, and then when we let n be very large, it approximates minus infinity to infinity, or minus something large to something large. Uh, so, so when you're doing this with data, what you have to do is uh, here. So you discretize your data. You have a function like that one. Then you discretize it. And then if this is the origin, I need to take this all here and move it here. So you have the, this is the center, the origin, this, and then this part here. If you use Mathematica, you have to do that yourself. And I use Mathematica. If you use MATLAB, MATLAB does it for you. So you don't have to worry. Um, and the interesting thing is you can see that when you approximate a Fourier transform with a discrete Fourier transform like this, um, the discrete Fourier transform looks like the Fourier transform divided by some normalization factor. But it is sampled at values m divided by n times delta x, where delta x is the spacing of your samples in the initial function, and n is the number of steps. So if I have my function here, and let me sh come back. No, uh, let me go down, sorry. So I have my initial function, but of course, to enter this, I cannot use the continuum of points. I, I take a delta x being a spacing. I take these spacings, and I take the values. That spacing is delta x. So if I multiply delta x by n, what do I get? So I have something like this. And then I do this spacing is delta x. And then I have n points. So delta x by times n is what? Is, 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 the, is, is the size of the interval that I'm using. Because it's how many steps times the size of each step. So what this tells me is that if I sample that way, then the Fourier transform is going to be sampled at spacings that are the inverse of n times delta x, that is, the, the, the total range. And this, what that means is that if I want, if I have something, I want to then increase my, my sampling here. I want to be, make it more, more densely sampled. I should not make my initial function more densely sampled. Making my function more densely sampled will add values to the sites, will not add values, uh, increase the sampling. If I want to increase the sampling, instead I should add values to the site. So I have this at given spacing. And then I need to keep going this way and keep going this way. And if the function finishes, that means put zeros. That's what is called padding with zeros. So you put a bunch of zeros here, a bunch of zeros here. And then when you do your Fourier transform, your result's going to be more, more nicely sampled. So to increase the resolution here, you add zeros to the sites here and the other way around. If you want to add zeros to the sites here, you need to increase your sampling spacing. And that is important because it turns out if you don't sample well enough, this is not going to die by the end of it gets here, and this is not going to die out by the end it gets here. And if it doesn't finish, whatever doesn't fit here comes around and comes to the other end and overlaps with this. This, is, this operation is sort of defined on a cylinder. So whatever spills out comes on the other side. It's like when you're playing Nintendo or something, and you go out one side of the screen, and you come out the other side of the screen. So you want to avoid that. And for that, you need to do more and more sampling. We'll see this uh, numerically uh, later. OK. Very good.
OK, so let me now, uh, any questions? I'll, I'll show this with a lot of examples later, but I want to do some physical optics before. So we see all this together with, with, the, with the physical optics. Yes? Ah, yes, sorry. The, so this delta x is not the same as that delta x. It's the same letters, but it means something different. On that context, delta x means spacing. On here, it means the width of the function. So I should have called that uh, uh, little delta x or something, just to, to, to differentiate. Yeah. Yes, and I, 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 I'll send you, I, I wrote an article on this, so on the uncertainty relation for the DFT. So, so there is a different uncertainty relation. It's, uh, it's, it's a bit more complicated, but it has a nice interpretation, but uh, that I don't have time to cover that. But I, I actually wrote a paper about it, so I can, I can, I can give it to you. It, it, the, the uncertainty relation for the discretized version involves n. So the right-hand side of the uncertainty relation goes like 1 over n, the number of points. Yeah. OK. So let's change topics for a little bit. And come here. So who has heard of Maxwell's equations? Who has not heard of Maxwell's equations? Good. So why, why, why are these called Maxwell's equations? Did Maxwell come up with them? No. So why does he get credit? It was Ampere, Faraday, Gauss. And in fact, there were a lot of other people, Priestley, Coulomb, uh, 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 Cavendish, that came up with, this, with many of these laws and didn't get the credit. Uh, what did Maxwell do? Yeah, he fixed one of them. So here I'm giving the incomplete versions. We're, I'm, 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 I, I'm missing here the charges and the currents. And this equation did not have this term. Maxwell realized that this term was missing. So when you have charges and currents, there's other terms uh, here and another term here. But for the sake of this class, uh, I'm going to skip them. Uh, oddly enough, I have to teach my class to my students in Rochester at 5 in another classroom with Skype. And I'm going to go through this. <laughs> going to be the same lecture. I'm just going to go into more detail there with the, with the other terms. Um, you'll probably have enough lectures, but if when, when Professor Imrana finishes here, if you want to go to the next room and hear more lectures, I'll, I'll be in the next room. OK. So what Maxwell did was find this. And these are laws that tell you the relation between electricity and magnetism. If you have a circuit with current, that, that interacts with a magnet. And if you move a magnet through a loop, you induce a current and all these, these things. And also the, the repulsion between charges, etc. If you write that in differential form, it gives you this. Now, uh, the other extremely important thing that Maxwell did is if you take, for example, this one, and you take the curl, and you use these properties that at some point you probably knew that it's the curl of a curl. It turns out to reduce to the gradient of the divergence minus the Laplacian. And because the divergence of E from this one is zero, this gives you the minus the Laplacian. Then here, uh, you take the curl of this. You swap the order between the time derivative and the curl. And then the curl here, you use this other one. You substitute it. And at the end, you get an equation like this, which is the wave equation. It's an equation for a wave that is traveling at a velocity equal to 1 over the square root of whatever is sitting here. And that was the most, have been one of the most wonderful times in the history of physics, because p 
people knew about light, and there was a, something that traveled very fast. They measured the velocity of light to some precision, uh, Foucault and, and, and uh, uh, Fiso. Uh, they, they, they used this clever trick. Do you know of these experiments? So they had a wheel. The, the, the first version was with a wheel like this with a lot of slits. And then you had a candle here. And then a mirror several miles away. I don't know how they did this. Uh, and you could spin this very fast. You look through this hole here of the, uh, the mirror, the flame coming through this hole here. So you could see the light. Then you start spinning it. And you start spinning so fast that the light going through here, by the time it comes back, is no longer hitting this slit, but it's hitting the, 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 this, this blocking thing. So you don't see the light again. But then you spin it faster. And then you start seeing it again through the next one. And with that, you can measure the speed of light with some accuracy. Then uh, the version of uh, Foucault was more precise. He used, I think, a uh, barrel like this with mirrors on the sides. And it was, so, so these were mirrors. You were looking uh, this way, let's say. And the candle was here. So the light went here, came back here, like that. And this spin again. So, so he could do it with more precision. And, found that it was ballpark what the, the, the true velocity of light is. But when they combine, when Maxwell and, and others uh, combined these equations to find this, they found that mu zero times epsilon zero, which were found from experiments with electricity and magnetism, nothing to do with light. This gives you a wave equation whose velocity is the velocity of light. And that's amazing. So, so not only did they unify electricity and magnetism, but also optics. Light is an electromagnetic wave, and it satisfies that. That's a remarkable, remarkable thing. Sometimes we forget about how amazing that is. So once we have this wave equation, so I have the second derivative, the Laplacian of E uh, minus uh, let me then write 1 over c squared, the velocity of light, second derivative with respect to time of E is equal to 0. And what happens if the field is monochromatic? If I assume the, that the field is monochromatic. Monochromatic means only one. So I can say E is some u of only the spatial position times something that depends on time, which is e to the minus i omega t, or minus i 2 pi nu t, if we want. So then if I take this derivative with respect to this one, what do I get? This is independent of time, so that doesn't change. So on this side, I get the Laplacian of u of r, then minus. What happens when I take two derivatives here? Minus and minus gives me plus, And I get an omega squared divided by c squared, and then just u of r. And both are multiplied by the exponential, but then I divide by the exponential, and it's gone. And this is called the Helmholtz equation. And uh, we call k is equal to what? Omega over c. So I can call this k squared. And it's also equal to what else? 2 pi over lambda, the wavelength. So I can write this as the Laplacian of u r plus k squared u r equals 0. And remember, the electric field is a vector. But for much of what we're going to do, we're going to forget about it. We're going to use it as scalar, just one number. And what that means is we take one component and we use it as a representative. However, when do you need to use the full vector? When you're doing optics with polarization, when you 
care about the polarization of light, then you have to worry about the different components. If not, no. So for now, I'm going to forget the, the components. So I have an equation like this. Scalar equation. And that's the equation that we're going to solve to model propagation of, say, laser light. Is that clear? So it's only one component. Then we can put back the many components. They're all solutions of this equation, and they satisfy the divergence condition. Okay. Can anyone tell me a solution of this equation, a very simple solution? The simplest you can find? Ex exponential. So you, let me say, uh, k arrow, I'm going to symbolize that, of r is equal to an exponential. Because I know that if I take a second derivative, this, when I take a second derivative, has to give me something negative so that it cancels this positive thing. So therefore, I, to get a negative second derivative, I need to put i, i here. And then I need something that gives me something like a square. So I'm going to put, but, but this is in three-dimensional space, so I'm going to put r to make this general. But in the exponent, I need to multiply this by something to make it a scalar. I cannot take the exponential of a vector. So I should do k vector dot r. And this is called a... Plane wave. Why is it a plane wave? Suppose that, let me think of this as z. OK, so here's where you know who does optics and who doesn't. In all other fields of physics, the z-axis points up. In optics, the z-axis points to the right. <laughs> and I always tell students, the first law of optics is light goes from left to right. If light is going from right to left, then optics doesn't work. It's just, it's just, it's <laughs> Unless you're doing microscopy, then it can go down. That's, that's fine. So what happens if the vector k goes in this direction? So let's think of this dot product. Suppose that I'm at a point here, r. What is this dot product equal to? has to do with the projection of this point onto the direction of this point. That means that this point will make this dot product take some value. What about this other point here? Will the dot product be a bigger value, a smaller value, or the same value? The same. Yeah, the cosine is is smaller, but this distance is uh, so no sorry the co the angle is smaller so cosine is larger, but this distance is smaller, and those cancel out. Turns out the only thing that matters is if I take this vector that is fixed, I look at all the points that are projected on a perpendicular onto this, they all give me the same k dot r. The the, the dot product is a projection. So. At this point, and at this point, and at this point, and at this point, the, the, the wave takes the same value. So, so, and of course, this is in one line, but also out of the board. So in the whole plane, the wave takes the same value. If I come to another point here, that's a different value. But this is the same as this, 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 and all, all those. So this wave is constant over planes that are perpendicular to the k vector. So for this k, all this plane is constant, and then this other plane is constant, etc. That's why we call it a plane wave. And I, I remove the time dependence, but as I let time go, these would move and travel at, at the speed of light. So this we call a plane wave. Now, what happens if I take this plane wave? So I ask you, what is the solution of that? And you told me this, but we haven't checked. Let's, let's check. There's more to it than just saying that it is. So let's see. 
So what happens if I take the derivative of this? So what is the, the second derivative of this u k of r? So when I take a gradient, I bring down i times the vector k. Then when I take the second derivative, because this is dot with the first derivative, I bring out another i and another k, and the two k's are dot with each other. So I get minus k dot k times u. OK? I could write this as magnitude of k, but I will not for a reason that will be obvious. So, so if I substitute this in here, what do I get? Uh, I get, uh, well, let me write it as the exponential, sorry. e to the i k dot r. If I substitute this, I get minus k dot k, the exponential, plus little k squared, the exponential, equals zero. Can I cancel anything? The exponential. And then I'm left with k dot k equals little k squared. So that's the, that's the condition for this to work. So k dot k is equal to k squared. So you might say that means that the length of this wave vector k is what? If, if this is the wave vector, but this is the origin here, my shoulder, what is the vector from here, the, the, the magnitude of that? Is, is little k. With some catch. So let me write uh, k as 2 pi divided by lambda times a vector u. Where this is, of course, little k. What, what happens then to this equation? k dot k is little k squared u dot u equal little k squared. Can cancel this, and this is 1. So u is what type of vector? A unit vector. So the solutions then are plane waves I can write as e to the i 2 pi divided by lambda unit vector u dot r. That's another way of writing it. So, but u x, sorry, u dot u, if I write it in terms of the components, how does it look? u x squared, y squared plus u c squared, and this is equal to 1. That means that of these three components, how many are independent? How many do I need to specify? Only two. The third one I can find from this expression. And I always choose it so that the wave goes from left to right. <laughs> so I want u to be greater than u. So u z is given by what? If I solve this equation. Square root of 1, ux squared plus uy squared, let's say. Okay. And I have an uncertainty here, whether I use the plus or the minus results here. But the plus result is a wave that goes from left to right. 
and the other one is one that goes from right to left. And I'm going to assume that all my light goes from left to right, so I just always choose that one. But there's a catch, another catch here. I could also find solutions where this is imaginary. If ux squared plus ur squared are bigger than 1, then this thing here can be uh, imaginary. And that's something that I don't know if I have time, but we'll see it. It's something called an evanescent wave. How many of you have heard of evanescent waves? OK. So there are two types of plane waves. The traveling plane waves, or homogeneous plane waves, and then there's the evanescent waves. And I'll show you some, some uh, illustrations of this. So, so the plane wave, I can write then as e to the i, 2 pi, ux divided by lambda times x, plus uy divided by lambda times y. And let me write this as e to the i. I'm going to separate the last one, 2 pi. Uh, uz divided by lambda z, where this depends on ux and uy. If I write a vector uh, nu like this as ux divided by x, uy divided by y, uh, sorry, by lambda, then I can rewrite this expression in a form that's going to start to look familiar. e to the i, 2 pi. Remember, I'm using arrows for vectors in 3 space and underlines for vectors in 2 space. How can I write this in terms of this? New dot. I'm going to call it, as I did before, x with an underscore. And this looks like what lives inside of a Fourier transform. So we're going towards Fourier transforms in terms of plane waves. And then we have e to the i, 2 pi, uz, which I'm going to write as 1 minus ux squared plus uy squared divided by lambda c. So this is a form for a plane wave. Here I'm going to represent, uh, let me use the second version, the plane wave in terms of a, a figure. So this is, let's say, a, a, a plane wave traveling in the direction of the z-axis from left to right. And in fact, I, I'm going to see how it evolves when time goes by by a quarter of a cycle. So if, it, if, if this moves by a quarter of a cycle, that is those wavefronts are advancing a little bit. Now let me come back to the beginning. This case of x is, think of it as use of x. And let's forget about use of y. We're only in one plane. If I change use of x, what happens is I'm going from a vector that goes like this, this is where this is the c direction, to a vector with x components, so this is x. So that means that the plane wave is now going to go in that direction. And if I keep going, it's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just increasing the x component, but that comes at the cost of the z component having to be shorter, because this magnitude is fixed. And then, uh, then I reach a point where this is flat like that. And then that means I'm already here. The 
the x component is 1. You would think, I cannot make it any bigger than 1 because the vector's already going like that. Well, I can force it to be bigger than 1 at the cost of the c component being now imaginary. So if I keep going, this starts to uh, oscillate faster, but now I have e to the i something times something imaginary. I have an i here, and I have an i here. i times i give me what? Minus. And e to the minus something times z gives me something that in the c direction drops the case. So this is the evanescent wave. It's a wave that oscillates faster than the wave can, the, the, the traveling wave can, at the cost that in the other direction it has to drop. And these waves don't travel very far. They die very soon. As we will see uh, tomorrow, <laughs> we can decompose any field, any image, by using Fourier theory in terms of these waves. This is like the superposition in the Fourier expansion. But in the Fourier expansion, we need all values of nu. Some of those values of nu correspond to traveling waves. Some correspond to evanescent waves. And those will not travel far. They will decay very quickly. And that is another way of seeing the fundamental resolution limit, because the information in those waves doesn't make it to our detectors. It's, it's gone forever. The only way to see it is with what's called near field microscopy, which is you don't use lenses, you use a tip that you bring right next to the object. And then you detect those waves before they decay. But if you don't do that, they're gone forever. Uh, so, and this is the same if we go in the other direction. So this is going up. If I go down, then I also get into the evanescent wave. Now, one thing that I'm plotting here that is going to be interesting for what we're going to do next is the red line is the slice in this direction of this wave. So it has the same period. So it's maximal here because this is maximal here. It's maximal here because it's maximal here. It's the slice. So if I just look at the slice here, it's like a sinusoidal whose frequency varies slowly. The more, the more close to, fo to the C direction the wave is going, the more slowly that varies. And if I go, if I tilt this, this starts oscillating faster over the initial plane. And then to oscillate very fast, we have to go into the evanescent waves. The green line is the imaginary part. The red part is only the real part, which is what I'm plotting here. What does the imaginary part tell us? So the re real part is telling us what that wave is doing, let's say, now. The imaginary part tells you what the wave is going to be doing in a quarter of a cycle. So it's sort of looking forward into the near future. So for example, this is at, at the initial time. But if I propagate in time, quarter of a cycle, then I get into, now this wave corresponds to the green, not to the red. So the imaginary part tells you wh where you're going in a quarter of a, of, of a period. And it serves to distinguish between what's going, say, up from what's going down. Because the relative position between the red and green line reverses even for the same frequency. And I should, I should uh, pass the baton. Uh, so tomorrow, uh, what we're going to do is take these ideas, these plane waves, put it together with Fourier theory, and see how things, how wave fields propagate in space. It turns out that this part is going to provide the Fourier transform. And this is how, uh, this tells you what happens to each Fourier component as it propagates. This part is essentially the transfer function of free space. And because free space is a linear shift invariant system, it's described by a transfer function, which is precisely this. So we will be doing numerical modeling of propagation of wave fields and, and several things using this idea of expressing any field as a superposition of plane waves. 
and then each plane wave is like a Fourier component, and then the longitudinal part is, is the, the transfer function, which is, is oscillatory for traveling waves and is real and decaying for evanescent waves. So I'll put these two pieces together uh, tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Anna, you want to take over? So now Professor uh, Consortini is going to give a, a short uh, description of what she's going to be doing in the lab. Do you want me to put the, the, the presentation? <laughs> okay, okay. They're, they're a rotated version of. Okay, so. Thank you very much. There we go. No, yeah, please uh, erase. I, 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 you can start and I, I will erase for you. So, you know that. laboratories, microscopy, uh, computer, and the diffraction laboratory. Here, I will explain you what happens in diffraction laboratory. And uh, uh, the diffraction laboratory is the, the room nearby the shaker effect. So, the best I am not speaking loud enough. Uh, I have no. I don't know where to put it. This one. I have no. Put it in your, in your name. Is this okay? This also should go here, okay? We don't know. So, as I thought before, there are three kinds of the laboratories. The microscope laboratory, which is in the lab, in the M-Lab app. The uh, computer laboratory, which is in a room nearby here, the Denardo room. And the diffraction laboratory, which is uh, nearby the secretariat room. Uh, our groups uh, are made of 10 people each time. But for the diffraction laboratory, 10 people together are too many. So I have decided to divide those 10 people in five pe two subgroups of five people each. So we will have roughly one hour and a half for each subgroup. So the first five people of a group corresponding to this laboratory will come first. And the second five group people, and the second group of five people will become later. Let's say one hour and a half later. But if we need a little bit more time, maybe we can go a little bit further, which is likely. The experiments uh, we will do, although they are in the laboratory of, of diffraction, are not exactly all, the, all diffraction experiments. So we will start with uh, diffraction and Fourier transforms. This is the first group of, of experiments. One experiment on evanescent waves and several demonstrations of uh, decomposition of light by diffraction gratings. There is an important point that I want to establish from the very beginning. Our eyes are sensitive to energy, not to the field. And of course, everybody knows that optics is a field amplitude and phase. But we never see amplitude and phase. We always see only energy, which means 
proportionality, but amplitude square. So what we see, for instance, is not a Airy function. It's the modulus square of the Airy function. Oh, the, to describe the, upper, the diffraction from an aperture, we will consider different apertures, and uh, we will examine the uh, region uh, where the field is diffracted. Starting from an impinging plane wave, which is typically a helium neon laser, uh, we have or an opening, or a wire, or something else. And on the other side of the screen, we have a region of diffracted field. The region of the diffracted field is typically divided in two regions. Fresnel region, which is far from the aperture with respect to the wavelength, but not far enough to be considered at infinity. When we go further, in principle, to the infinity, to the infinity, we have the diffraction region. We will experience diffraction of radiation helium neon laser, wavelength 632 or 33, if you want to uh, a number one round, by wires of different uh, dimension, slits of different width, and by circular apertures of different ra radius. Diffraction gives rise to evanescent waves also. But the experiment on evanescent waves will be made in different way. Uh, in the diffraction, especially um, from, we, we will consider mostly in our theoretical part, no, with reference to theoretical part of opening, slit and uh, a circular aperture, it's important the angular dependence of the aperture, because this is related to the resolving power. And so we will check the angular dependence by measuring the width of the diffraction of the pattern at infinity in different cases. In particular, uh, we will consider two different uh, circular apertures, and we will compare the uh, width of the diffraction pattern with the width of the aperture. And we will confirm uh, this uh, um, way uh, that, from the point of view of the optics, uh, we know that as smaller is the hole and larger is the diffracted field, the angular. And from the point of view of the, um, frene, um, of, of the transform, Fourier transform, this confirms what you already know, um, that the as smallest is uh, the width of the function, the largest is the width of the transform. Uh, by the way, from the circular apertures, Considerations on the resolving power, for instance, of the telescopes can be made, while the case of the microscope requires a little bit more attention, but this end, the microscope resolving power, is developed in the corresponding laboratory where ab formula is most important, so we will not see anything about this. And we will confirm by looking at this a diffracted field that uh, a function rect has a transform, a sink. Of course, we will see a sink square, and the sink has a function, transfer function, an ID function, which is a Bessel function of a given argument divided by argument, again the square. If the border of the aperture, if the aperture is uh, uh, the border of the converge, a converging lens, the transform, which uh, in the theory of diffraction from the aperture goes to the infinity in the Fraunhofer region, by the lens is transferred to the focal plane. And therefore, in the focal plane, we can see that the lens operates the Fourier transform of the field on its aperture, not the field from the the field from an object which reaches 
the aperture of the lens. And this is the basis. Uh, sometimes people say that the lens operates the Fourier transform, but we must be careful. It's not the lens that operates the Fourier transform. It's the border of the lens. that Diffraction takes place every time there is an abrupt change of the amplitude. And this is made by the border. Uh, as a consequence, the phase adjusts in a suitable way. But I don't want to enter in this uh, point. The fact that in the focus of an upper, of an, uh, a lens, in the focal plane of a lens, one has the transform, the Fourier transform of the field of the aperture, is the base of the elaboration of images. And uh, because uh, one can utilize a convolution theorem to elaborate amplitude and phase in this case, images which are on the entrance of a lens, in the front entrance of the lens. Of course, this is not what we will do, but I like to mention this. Now we make an experiment on evanescent waves. As Professor um, Miguel uh, showed you, uh, a evanescent wave is a solution of Maxwell equation uh, where a wave propagate along a um, plane, let's say flow along a plane, but decreases exponentially from the surface. In my case, the propagation direction in the plane is uh, uh, not, not, a, not x, it's the opposite as here, but uh, it's clear. I will show you a, an equation in a while. And those waves cannot exist without a surface. They, they were generated and the longer which they propagate. Typical cases are diffraction, because at the border of the diffracting, in the plane of a diffracting aperture, you have the evanescent waves propagating along the aperture. And as uh, uh, it was already said, these uh, are lost because they cannot be collected by common lenses. You, if you want to, to collect them, you have to go near the surface uh, on a kind of a microscopy, which is called the near field microscopy. But evanescent waves are present in many phenomena. In addition to diffraction, one has diffract evanescent waves in the total reflection, such as in uh, prisms uh, when we reach a total reflection, or in fibers. In fibers, uh, light propagates, uh, mo modes propagates in uh, the fibers just because total reflection allows uh, guided propagation. Oh, this is my, the um, uh, geome geometry of our, of our, of our uh, experiment. Uh, in any case, to understand this uh, part, we have VPT is the um, complex amplitude that uh, uh, was already mentioned by uh, Professor Alonso. This, uh, you see, there are two parts. One, A is a constant of no importance, and then an exponential depending on X. And this part altogether is the amplitude. And then we have another part with the I, which is the, the phase. So we see, looking at this part, that the phase propagation takes, pl takes place in zeta direction. That means along the, this uh, surface. This is the surface. But in, in principle, the phase is everywhere, because you can go even here with the phase. But the amplitude decreases exponentially immediately as soon as you move a little bit from the first surface. Because note that uh, k is uh, 2 pi over lambda. And therefore, as lambda is very small, as soon as x reaches values uh, some multiples of the wavelength, this exponential goes uh, rapidly to 0. 
So the experiment on evanescent waves is of this kind. We produce an evanescent wave by sending a laser beam on a prism. Oh, by the way, this morning, for instance, I prepared just the opposite direction. The laser beam coming here, going here and here. So instead of looking at evanescent wave over this uh, uh, surface, uh, we will see this on one uh, of the others. But this is uh, of no importance. Then we collect the, the what happens here? A laser beam, which is real, goes inside the prism and remains real. And then it is, a comp it is a, a reflected by total reflection. So in principle, on this side of the prism, there is, should be nothing. On the contrary, there is the evanescent field, which propagates along the surface. With the, um, this phenomenon, has a reciprocity. That means that if you have a field, evanescent field on a surface uh, created for some reason, on, on the other side of the surface, you have a real field, reciprocity. So in the fiber, for reciprocity, by uh, approaching the fiber near the surface where the evanescent wave go, uh, moves, uh, propagates, the evanescent wave enter the fiber, or better, there is a coupling between the evanescent wave of the prism and the lateral surface of the fiber, and, and inside the fiber you produce a real field. And in this wave, in this way, to the end of the fiber, we will see the light. So we will see the light entering the prism, going back on the other side. Here, nothing. But as soon as we put the fiber, we see on top of the, on the, at the end of the fiber, the light. And this will be done with a green laser. Then the third gro group of experiments uh, is uh, the composition of light by diffraction gratings, uh, which is the basis of spectroscopy. Uh, if we consider a, a diffraction grating linear, that means we have a number of uh, parallel, uh, parallel opening, let's say, or ca they can be reflecting instead of, uh, um, we can have transmission and reflection. Okay, it can be reflecting or transmitting. Here the example is in the transmitting case, and we will uh, mostly make experiments uh, with the transmitting case, but in some cases also for reflection. An impinging light in this example is red, um, impinges on the grating, and uh, as you probably all of you know, from the grating, a number of spectra directions uh, where the diffracted field, all the diffracted waves um, interfere constitutively. Do, do you know, who knows uh, those things, or, or better, who doesn't know about diffraction grating? Everybody of you knows about diffraction gratings? Yes? OK. So it's not difficult to see, but thinking, for instance, of in uh, Fresnel diffraction, Eugen's Fresnel principle, if we go, we consider this opening very small, and we consider light going out from this, uh, and we consider rays, we have a constructive diffraction when the difference in the path, which is here, can be seen this, this part here, is a multiple, multiple of an entire multiple of the wavelength. The multiple can be positive a positive or negative value, but when uh, m, apart from the case, when everything is parallel, and in case uh, we don't see the dependence uh, on the wavelength. And therefore, we can separate the light of a given color from another just by looking at the diffracted field from the grating. 
this is almost all. And we will use uh, linear gratings of different periods. Uh, one of the best is uh, the 600. And we will see the composition from different sources uh, going uh, from lasers and LEDs. And in case of the lasers, uh, we will have two different lasers, one red and one green. Both are aluminum laser, but the, one, the green one of course, works with a different wavelength. And we can see the relationship between the wavelengths of the two lasers by looking at the difference in separation of uh, the uh, diffracted beams of or the diffracted beams of the same order. So for instance, we will see that the Green and red go in different direc directions. Uh, I will show also something uh, produced by a two-dimensional grating. A two-dimensional grating is uh, something like this, where there are lines uh, in horizontal, uh, in two directions, uh, one normal to the others. And this is all. Uh, the University of Florence uh, gave us uh, the open lab of the university some diffraction gratings. The electrosynchrotone um, is supplying this as an error. Uh, some lasers uh, and the experiments in the laboratory are organized by Imrana, Professor Imrana, uh, Dr. Mitchell Dynalov and from uh, Electra, and myself. Okay, this is all. Oh, I forgot to say something. Uh, I have recovered from uh, lectures given in 1993, which means 24 years ago, um, some, no, a, a, a lecture on evanescent waves. But of course, in order to follow clearly this lecture, you need to know what happens before plane waves. So I will upload in the, uh, in the paper that we'll put in, uh, in the lectures, I will upload a, a link. I will give a link to this in such a way if someone is, more, is interested in see how these things are developed, this will be, maybe can be useful. It's very old, but it's still the same. Diffraction is always the same. Okay, this is okay. This is you, ho finito. Okay, thank you, thank you to you. Uh, now this can be cancelled. Can I take the last five minutes just to find it? <laughs>